we left off, we had just pointed out that NADH and FADH2 contribute two electrons for every uh, molecule, FADH2 or NADH, to the electron transport chain, but that FADH2 adds its electrons to the chain at coenzyme, I'm sorry, at ubiquinone, not at NADH hydrogenase. So there's fewer hydrogen ions pumped per FADH2 molecule that contributes electrons than for NADH that contributes electrons. Now I mistakenly uh, mentioned that because your book had, uh, your, your textbook has pictures of single hydrogen ions being pumped out at each of these three complexes, that there were, uh, there were three hydrogens pumped out for every NADH and two hydrogens pumped out for every, every FADH2. That is wrong. Um, and and I, I misspoke there. And as we'll see, when we consider now, come over here and look at hydrogen ion flow through ATP synthase to produce to the mechanical energy that will drive the synthesis of ATP, the phosphorylation of ADP, we will see that, in fact, there are um, more hydrogens pumped out than one, usually about four per complex, so that every NADH molecule that contributes electrons to the electron transport chain will produce 12 hydrogen ions that are pumped out of the matrix into the intermembrane space, whereas for FADH2, it's eight, elect eight protons are pumped out uh, into the intermembrane space. And, and so we end up with quite a, a large chemiosmotic gradient of hydrogen ions it's like uh, osmosis is driving hydrogen in to the, to the um, matrix, but that, um, that this is not osmosis of water, this is osmosis of protons, so we call it chemiosmosis. And the mechanism by which ATP is, is phosphorylated then in this case by ATP synthase is called the chemiosmotic uh, process of ATP generation. And we call the ATP generation here oxidative phosphorylation because we're oxidizing, um, we're using redox reactions to finally donate electrons to oxygen producing water. So this is going to be called oxidative phosphorylation as opposed to substrate, phos substrate level phosphorylation which occurred previously in the uh, glycolysis and the Krebs cycle in the production of ATP at those steps. So if we move on and look now at the principles we've said the accumulation of protons in the intermembrane space is going to drive the protons into the matrix by diffusion by chemiosmosis. Also there's the force that drives um, protons into the matrix is that they're an electrostatic attraction. There's an electrostatic attraction because hydrogen ions are positively charged and the matrix is negatively charged with respect to the inter intermembrane space because of all the pumping of protons out. So there's an electrostatic attraction of hydrogen ions for the matrix, and also there's the osmotic drive uh, for them to get back into the matrix. And it is ATP synthase then that capitalizes on these forces to drive the phosphorylation of ADP and produce ATP. And here is a schematic of this molecule. Let's look at it rather quickly. We have hydrogen ions that are going to flow through a domain of the protein that we call the rotor. And that will actually cause this rotor to spin, as we'll see. Um, <clears throat> the, the domain of the protein that is catalytic, that actually is responsible for phosphorylating ADP to produce ATP, is called the uh, F1 catalytic complex. And that is held in place by a stator protein that um, makes sure that this does not rotate when the rotor here rotates and the stalk or axle rotates. Um, the stalk will rotate inside this catalytic, these catalytic subunits, inside this complex. And in order that these not move, they are held in place by this stator uh, complex of proteins. So this is a quite an amazing protein. I like to say it rocks, and it rocks really hard because of what it does. Protons flow through it. That, the, that proton flow is transduced into mechanical rotary energy. 
And that rotary energy then is transduced into energy that can drive the energonic reaction of phosphorylation of ADP to produce ATP in the catalytic subunit. So I'd like to pause now and go to a, um, a tutorial on ATP synthase because it is such an important molecule. So here is our ATP synthase. In this case, we've oriented the molecule in the opposite direction than was shown on your previous slide. In this little schematic here, we have the inner, the inner mitochondrial membrane sh shaded in gray, and the, um, the matrix then, the uh, matrix would be down, the mitochondrial matrix, matrix would be down from this membrane, and the intermembrane space would be up, showing a high concentration of hydrogen ions. And in our schematic here, we can see that we have uh, several, uh, several complexes that are part of this amazing protein. The F0 complex is embedded in the inner membrane, in, in, the, in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And it has C subunits, 12 C subunits, shown over here on, at, uh, to the left, you can see them better. There are 12 of these C subunits. There is one A subunit shown here but not in the schematic yet, and then a B subunit, which we call the STATAR, which anchors uh, these, uh, these uh, A subunits and the catalytic complex called the F1 complex in the matrix down below. And there is an axle or a stalk that connects the rotor to the catalytic complex. So this is the overall structure of the, uh, com uh, of the ATP synthase as it sits in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So let's go over here to the left now and look at this in a little uh, in a little more detail. So let's first of all look at the A subunit. Uh, let's focus in on just the FO complex and now we'll show the A subunit as well as the 12 uh, as the C subunits. So here are the 12 C subunits that comprise the rotor and then this is the A subunit that has four alpha helices in it. Now each C subunit, there are 12 of these C subunits, they consist of a, of a two helix, two alpha helix um, motif that is connected by a short loop. So the uh, C terminal alpha helices are shown in dark purple and the pink uh, alpha helices are the N terminal helices. And in the C terminal helices, these red highlighted, this high, red highlighted residue is the um, are a, a, sp are a spartic acids, number 61, a spartic, aspartate 61. And those play a key role in accepting and donating protons, that is hydrogen ions, as, the, as they flow through this protein. So we'll see that in just a second. Now if we look at the A subunit here, which is held, which does not rotate as the rotor, as the C rotor rotates, it's held in place by the stator subunit, which is not shown. There's a key residue here called arginine 210, and that arginine 210 creates a very hydrophilic uh, environment whereby the, uh, the aspartate 61 of one of the subunits can donate a proton to, the, to, to this um, A, A subunit complex, and in so doing that, proton will flow through the protein as we shall see sh shortly. Now, how is it that this rotor can actually physically rotate? This is a machine, a molecular machine. How is it that this machine operates? Well, I want you to focus on the two C subunits, two out of the 12 of the rotor, that lie closest to the A subunit. And at this point in the cycle, this, um, this aspartate, this aspartic acid 61 will donate a proton. It has been protonated and it will donate that proton and that proton will leave. And then as the a rotor rotates one, one click in the 12 click rotation that comprises a full 360 degree rotation for it, it this aspartate will then become reprotonated when this subunit achieves this position in the rotation cycle. And when it is deprotonated, there's a profound conformational change that occurs in the, in, the, in the single C subunit when the aspartate becomes deprotonated. So if you consider all the other subunits besides this one, 
with the red Aspart 861 highlighted, they all have Aspart 861s that are protonated. And only they only become deprotonated when they click into this position near the A subunit. And the rotor's rotating in the clockwise direction here in the orientation that we're, we've oriented at. We're looking down on the membrane. So when this is deprotonated, let's look at what happens. Let's look at a single C subunit and watch what happens when it's deprotonated. Here it's protonated, ASP61 is protonated, and here it's deprotonated and the conformational change that occurs is that there's a profound twisting of especially this C terminal helix of the particular C subunit that's being uh, deprotonated at ASP at, at ASPART 861. Let's look at that again. Protonated, now deprotonated. And look at the conformational change that occurs. Note the profound twisting that occurs at the end here. And that twisting of that single uh, C subunit that, that becomes deprotonated at ASPART 861 rotates that subunit and spins that subunit. And that actually is like a wheel within a wheel of the larger rotor. That twisting causes a slight rotation, a single uh, step rotation of the rotor. So it is the deprotonation then of Aspart 861s on a single subunit of the 12 subunit rotor that causes the rotor to actually spin in the membrane that it's embedded in. It spins. So this has been visualized in an animation provided by the Gervin lab and we can see that over here that we're we're spinning into position and we are deprotonating and that's causing a twisting of that helix and that causes the um, spinning of the of the rotor. This is all available on uh, online from the Online Macromolecular Museum which is clickable from our syllabus so you can go through this on your own as well. So let's consider now the 12 subunits of the FO rotor and the protonation states of them. We have all 11 of these are protonated and only one shown in red is deprotonated. The yellows are protonated and the red is deprotonated. So what we'll see is, is this will spin and as each protonated subunit comes into this position, it, the ASP will become deprotonated due to the action of this, of this arginine present in the A subunit. And that will cause then twisting and the, and the rotor will spin one more click in its 12 click cycle. So here's a, a simulation of that rotation. This, so the A subunit remains stationary. That becomes protonated there. We just protonated this. And now we have, I've tried to simulate this as a spinning rotor. Protonated, deprotonated here, always protonated here at that position. And then that protonated subunit carries the proton around as, it, as the rotor spins around until it reaches this position, at which time it donates its proton. And that proton then will pass out into the, uh, pass through and into the matrix. So protons enter from the intermembrane space and protonate in a, a newly deprotonated aspartate at at that when the at the subunit in this position and then that subunit carries it around until here when it becomes deprotonated and the proton then leaves and goes into the matrix so that is how hydrogen ions are going to flow through this this molecule and that is how hydrogen ions are going to drive the rotation the mechanical rotation of this rotor we're transducing the chemiosmotic force into a kinetic force into a kinetic energy that is rotation of the rotor so we'll pick up with the catalytic subunit and the and transduction of the mechanical force into ATP synthesis uh, shortly in the next segment. Um, and, but before we do that in the next segment, I'm, we're going to look at the entry channel and the exit channel for hydrogen ions as they flow through this complex, through this amazing protein. And that's what we'll pick up with um, in the next segment.